turned up at Luton Airport and it was Michael Jackson and I was with him for 10 days. It was my right. first ever celebrity job. Have you had any other big name? Bella Hadid, Kendall Jenner, Rita Ora. And crowd crushing and overzealous fans, probably the biggest problem I ever had. Has the like crime in London really gone up? Oh, massively. Um, stabbings have gone through the roof. Watch theft, it's constant. Mobile phone theft, pandemic. Because the police can't do anything. Why not? I ain't got enough of them. Anyone who wears earphones in London should be shot. Simon, how did you become a bodyguard to the rich and famous? It's random. Yeah, I mean, it is. I didn't really start with that. I was in the British military many years ago. I did the Iraq War 2003, around that time. Um, and while I was out there, I was there for the part, uh, sort of like near the end, of the end of the war, the invasion and the start of the rebuild. Um, and private security companies started coming out to Iraq um, at the start of the rebuild. And uh, I had a friend of mine who'd left the military previously and he was working for one of them and I bumped into him and he said, oh, what are you doing out here? Um, I said, I'm with the army. He said, oh, what are you doing with the army? Why, you know, you need to be doing this. Obviously the money and the conditions and the job are slightly different to the military. Um, and I thought about it and I thought, well, that sounds like a bit of me. But um, I was still in the military at the time. Um, so I did a phone. Uh, I can't really remember how it works now because back then I don't remember having a mobile phone but I remember phoning um, London, it must have been on the military, you get, used to get um, like a phone card mm. um, and you get, you know, X I remember them at boarding school, the yeah, BT phone card. Yeah, so, yeah same sort of thing, yeah. um, Paradigm I think it was called, just right. one for the military. Um, so I called on that and, and they, um, my friend done me a CV because I'd never had a CV before in my life. Um, and they called me forward and then they realised I was in the military. So they said, we can't offer you a job while you're still in the military. So um, I went to see my sergeant major um, and said, look, I'm thinking about doing this. Um, and originally he said, it's quite early on to, the private security kind of blew up after that, certainly in the Middle East, but it's quite early on. And I was only 23, 24 years old, so I was quite young. He said, why don't you go and, go and do that for a couple of years, buy a house and come back to the army because you'll still be young enough. Because I like the army, I didn't want to leave the army. Yeah. Um, and I had quite a good number of courses coming up and a good career path for me if I wanted to stay in. Um, and I, I left, I took the job, um, went to Buckingham Gate in London. Actually, I've got an office now for a security company, which is just behind the one I went to that day, which I never thought I'd have. Mm. Um, and uh, within a month of leaving the military, I was back out in Iraq as a private security contractor. So right. that's kind of how I got into being a, a bodyguard, if you like. Mm. Um, and then from there, I, I did three and a half, four years in Iraq. I went on to Afghanistan after that with Foreign Commonwealth Office for, as a close protection officer for um, HMRC, who was working out there at the time, uh, training the, the Afghan drugs police. Wow. And mentoring them at their city gate checkpoints and at the airports, make sure they were checking things properly. Um, so I did that for two years. Yeah. And then I decided. When I was in the military, just going back slightly, I was in I was posted to Canada for a year as well. I've been in Iraq, I've been in, uh, with the military, and then I've been um, in, Iraq, in Iraq with private security for three or four years, and I've been in Afghanistan. So, and I was thinking, you know, all my early years of my life, I not really experienced doing what I want to do as which, such. Which is? Well, just a normal, what a 20, early 20s you would do, going absolutely. out, maybe going on holidays, you yeah. know, having a nice car for a bit, or whatever it might be. Um, the lad stuff, if you want to call it that. Mm. Um, I, I, I worked in dangerous places the whole of my life, really. Canada wasn't, obviously, but I was away from home. You know, we was on exercise a lot in Canada, so I didn't see much of normal life. Um, and I just thought, I think it's time for me to not be away now um, and go back to London. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I looked at prison service. I wanted to fancy being a PTI in the prison service. But at the time, this is obviously 2000 and seven or eight, I think it's going to go privatised. So I thought, I don't want to get into the prison service and then find out I can't do the job I want to do. So I forgot about that. Um, Sussex Police, they offered, kind of offered me a job with an anti-terrorist at Gatwick and told me all about it and the money just wasn't for me. It wasn't, you know, what I wanted to do. Because um, I lived down, sorry, I lived down in Eastbourne at the time, back then. So that was kind of my area down there. Um, and then I got a job with the Royal Family in London. Um, how, how far into your private security career were you? <coughs> so I started end of 2003, when yeah. I first went to Iraq. I finished Afghanistan somewhere through 2008. That was military? No, that was all private security, oh, okay, all that fine. piece. Yeah. So five, and, five and a half Dubai. years or something. And then after that, uh, I left Afghanistan, come home and I had a job with the Dubai Wall family, but it was in London. 
So it was when they come to London, they used to come to London um, for quite a long period through the summer. Um, and I was, uh, I think it was, it wasn't a full time job, it was like a, a eight or ten month contract. That sounds like a big job. Uh, the Dubai Royal family. There's a lot of guys on it. There's a lot of guys on it. And you had a, we had a, Do you mean as in, in the security detail? Or yeah, in the, the security the team for the family. Obviously, oh, it's right. huge. You know, yeah. there's, there's lots and lots of people on it. I mean, it's a lot different now to what it was when I was on it back then. But um, how's it different now? Just like anything else, things things move on. They might have more guys now. They might right. have streamlined it. I don't know how it all works now yeah. for them. But um, it it was a good job. I worked five days, five nights, five off. I had a lot of time off because if they weren't in, I was only on call. Yeah. Um, so I had plenty of money because yeah. uh, they gave us accommodation with the job. Um, it was not as exciting as it sounds, but it, it, you know, all of us, we all, all sort of stayed in the same house. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I did two years on that, and that's how I really started working in London and started being a bodyguard in London. I've missed probably quite an important piece out actually, um, which I always do. I've done so many different things all over the shop. So let's go back to Afghanistan. Um, you'll laugh when I tell you what I've missed out. Let's go back to Afghanistan. So I was on leave from Afghanistan. I used to work eight weeks on, four weeks off. Uh, a friend of mine on my team had the same holiday time as me because he used to go on, on leave in, in pairs. And uh, he said, well, he's from Scotland. He said, why don't you come up to Edinburgh at the start of the month and we'll just have a few nights out. I'd never been up there. So I said, great, thanks, we'll do that. Went up there, I had a phone call from someone. And they said, will you look after a gentleman coming into London on Monday? And I, I thought, I don't even want to do that. I've I'm, I'm only got a month off and I'm in Edinburgh, so I'm not even in London at the moment. And I said, no. So I said, you sure? I said, yeah, because I'm in Edinburgh. I can't do it. So that was that. Put the phone down. 25 minutes later, they rang me up again. I said, you sure? You, don't, you sure I can't get you to come down and do this job? Blah, blah, blah. So I said, uh, I said to my mate, I said, look, it's called me twice. And he said, go. He said, just go because... Um, bearing in mind at that stage, I'd never worked in London before um, because I was back, we've gone back to Afghan times now. Um, and I thought, I'll go and do it then. It's 10 days. Um, I'll go and do it to sort of meet people and see what it's all about in the UK. Um, so I got a flight, or we went out that night actually. I missed my flight in the morning night to get another one, which I just about made it in time. I got to Heathrow Airport because um, I, I couldn't get down to Eastbourne to get my stuff in, so I had to buy everything brand new out of the packet. Shoes, shirt, you know, you'd nice get the nice creases down the. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I had all that, trying to pull it tight so you can't yeah. really see them. I had all that going on. Um, turned up at Luton Airport, got given a document, and there was five of us there, people I'd never met before, but the security guys. Uh, and it was Michael Jackson. Wow. Yeah, Michael Jackson was flying in to go to the World Music Awards, um, and I was with him for 10 days. And was that your first? That was my first ever London job, my right. first ever celebrity job as well. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Your first celebrity job is Michael Jackson. It's Michael Jackson. I didn't even know it was. I was just told it's a businessman. No one said who it was because it, the visit at the time was a little bit hush hush. Um, right. They didn't want to cause because I don't think at the time it's two thousand November two thousand and six. This was so. I think at the time he hadn't been to the UK for quite a number of years, so it's quite a big thing that he was coming. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I did that. We um, went. What specifically did you do around Michael? Um, so there was five of us uh, plus one American bodyguard um, we just literally I was with him anywhere anytime he moved anywhere I was with him right. so um, we stayed in Bayswater in uh, West London uh, we didn't do that it's hard to someone like that to do too much because you know the fan base and the people that follow us around all the time it makes yeah. it very very difficult but um, we did a few we did a few things obviously we did the World Music Awards we went to Top Shop at midnight one night on Oxford Street and opened that up um, so we could get an outfit um, so they open the whole shop from just at midnight. For, just for him at midnight. Just yeah. to get an outfit. Yeah. 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 I um, love that. It's the safest <laughs> yeah. way to do it, yeah. yeah. Um, right, I see. So did you organise that because of the time? Yeah, yeah, because obviously you, you wouldn't be able to do it with people in there, it'd be impossible. No. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just easier for us and, yeah. and probably a nicer experience for him if he actually yeah. wants to choose something to wear. Yeah. Um, Guinness Book of Records, and I can't remember what he got an award for, but he right. did. A um, couple of meals. And we went to Mary Poppins with the children um, to watch a show, Mary Poppins right. show, which was interesting because when we went in to the show, and he was with us, um, I had one of the children, I was carrying one of the children because they were very young then. And uh, I remember sitting down, we went in in the dark, the show had already started and we sat down. And I remember sitting down thinking, well, this is all right. But 
no one noticed us. No one knew Michael Jackson was sat right in the middle of the, you know, the show. Mm. Um, but I thought, what happens in the interval? We're going to have to get out of here in the dark as well, otherwise we're going to be exposed quite quickly. Yeah. Um, and we went to the interval and the lights come on. We're still sitting there. Right. Um, all the actors on the stage froze. <laughs> I didn't really know what to do because they yeah. couldn't believe who was sitting in the, you know, in the audience. Yeah. Um, we'd luckily it wasn't a full auditorium, and we just very quickly had to slip out the back. And unfortunately, obviously, we couldn't go back in again after towards the second half. Yeah. So that was, you know, that was kind of the experience for them for that. And that's how busy the job was all the time. Yeah. You know, you always had to have a safe place for them to go, and always had to really want to go somewhere because the, the amount of time and effort it took into doing that safely. You'd never just go, I'll just pop in the shop quickly or I'm just going to go and, you know, we wouldn't do anything unnecessarily. No. So it was a good job, you know, it was a busy job all the yeah. way through, not, not a lot of sleep and you're always ready to go sort of thing. But um, Did you ever talk to him? Yeah, vaguely, not massively, no. I'll be honest, because there's a lot of people around him as well. Of course. You think you've got five or six security and then you've got, you know, all his aides and PAs and all, yeah. you know, we have bits and pieces. So, so um, was there like a big entourage with him everywhere? Relatively big, yeah, I think yeah. we had five cars I think just wow. with us but then you had about six or seven black cabs what fans had hired and put on the meter for the day so really? they can just jump in and follow us anywhere they want. So it sounds like their organising agent planning is as good as yours. Yeah well, <laughs> well some of them were paying fortunes to stay in this hotel just so they could be in the lobby when he come down because we wasn't letting non-hotel guests in while, while his stay was there but anyone who's paid for a room obviously you can't not let them in no. there so they were paying fortunes for sweets and whatever they could get their hands on just so they could sit in the lobby when he comes down and these, wow. these fans would fly all around the world you know trying to get hold of him and following him and yeah. so I don't know where they get the money from because they're no. all quite young and it cost a fortune but yeah and then on top of that you've got all the paparazzi all the motorbikes and all the other bit you know stuff that follows you around. And were, were they would they hound Michael? Yeah I mean they were quite tough and there was a lot of them back then. The other thing that was interesting is there wasn't any um, Instagram or yeah. social media. So I remember vaguely, I think we was on MTV. I think it was on BBC News at 10 or something like that. Uh, Sun newspaper, you know, a couple of the newspapers. Um, and I think that was about it for coverage. You know, I've, got, I've probably got five or six photographs of me with Michael Jackson. With all the other people I've been with, I've got there's a ton of young Getty images and yeah. Shutterstock and all that. You know, there's tons and tons and tons of it. but. Um, yeah, so we were back in the time where the social media and stuff wasn't a thing, which helped. Mm. Social media escalates today, yes. you know, for, for celebrities. Rob.team is my digital financial freedom platform where you can learn, earn, invest, start and scale a business and make, manage and multiply money. There are hundreds of hours of courses, resources, masterclasses you can join right now. It's all on the other side. I'll see you there. So does, um, but does that make your job harder then, social media? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it does. Sometimes. Well, it depends. It depends on the celebrity. It depends on how they use it. So obviously we educate them. If, uh, you know, we're talking about the A-list or super A-list mm. ones. Yeah. Um, don't, don't put you on first class seat going to London. So don't put There's, where you yeah, are if right you wanna, now. If you want to do it and you really want to post that, fine. But let's do it when we're on the car from Heathrow going into town. That you're, you know, do it behind. Do it afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you really want to do it, a lot of them won't because you think they've been doing it for many years. They don't care if they're in a first class seat. They don't care where they're flying to. Um, you know, even if on a private jet, that experience to them is not really a thing anymore. No. So they don't, they're not bothered about it. But yeah, you just have to, you just have to be careful. Yeah. Um, there's lots to do around that when you when you're looking after people. It's not just physically looking after people. Um, you have to think of their image and and what they're doing next. You know, are they about to do something what might cause them a problem in the media? Not not intentionally, but um, if someone's a bit too drunk or maybe they're wearing something what could be seen as derogatory. You know, but in, in no harm. Um, Intended, but you know, some but that's part of can, your detail can get blown. It kind of, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not. If if I didn't pick up on it, it's not. It's not. It's not what I'm there for. But I, I used to try and stop. It was um, it's a little example. Mm. I won't say who I was. I was looking after on this one, but there was a. We was leaving a hotel in London, and you know the porter trolleys you get where you can hang suits up and they put all the cases on and the yes. porters took like, gold looking things. In that, it come down in the lift with all luggage on it. And it come out through uh, the lobby 
And outside, where we were going to put it all into cars, was about 30 paps waiting for us to actually leave the celebrity. And I noticed as the guy was pushing it across the lobby, there's a bag swinging in the middle with Pornhub on it. Now, it's not that big a deal, but do you want Pornhub associated with yeah. whoever maybe you're looking at in front of the hub, what's basically going to be the world in a minute? Right. Um, was so, this a very well known person? Yeah, 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 very super well known, yeah. yeah. So obviously, I just quickly checked in it and put it in, um, I put it inside another bag. Right. And it wasn't even the, the person I was looking after, it was one of the makeup girls, and she had it purely because it was a, a cool little bag, you know, like a retro bag to have. And that's with what, Pornhub but, written but on that's it. What, yeah, it's just got, you know, it's not a, it's a well made bag. It, 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 it weren't a plastic one. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I kind of got the voice yeah. you had here. You know, there's nothing yeah. malicious, nothing malice in it, but you have to think about things like that because if mm. that got pushed out there now, and then you've got a Pornhub bag going into the car, what so and so is about to about get in in a minute. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the paparazzi in the papers these days, they love a story. Yeah, of course. Um, and that can get turned into anything you want. So um, just little things like that, really. Yeah, I mean, mm. if I missed that because I wasn't there, then it would have happened and it's not really my fault. But if you can stop things like that, obviously yeah. it's better. So in addition to Michael Jackson, have you had any other big name? Uh, Bella right. Hadid, I did um, oh. two or three years in London. Yeah. Uh, when she used to do London visits. It's a little bit of her sister, not a lot, Gigi. Yeah. Kendall Jenner. Yeah. Um, Rita Ora, a little, right. bit with, little bit yeah. in Europe with Rita as well. Yeah. Halsey, who's yeah. uh, out in LA. Um, quite a lot in Europe with her. And how did you land these jobs? Is, is it like when you've been with Michael, you get recommended or is, it, or is this all just luck? Um, How do you land it's, the jobs? it's a little bit of luck. So the Michael Jackson job didn't really do me any favours, to be honest, because oh, I no. went back to Afghanistan straight after, and then I was off the scene for quite a couple of years again because I was still working out, out of there. So, um, well, I, why didn't you carry on doing it and, and sort of leverage that? Yeah, well, I, I, I didn't really think of it at the time because I, I was contracted to go back, okay. and I'd not I'd only been out there one or two rotations before I did that job. So yeah. I still wanted to experience out there and do the job out there, really. Right. Um, so I didn't really have much want to go back to the UK at that particular time to sort no. of pursue that. Um, it's not, I oh know I never really appreciated that job. Well, I remember no. when I saw the document, I just thought, oh, it's Michael Jackson, oh, well, that's what he looks like. And, you know, it's just a, just yeah. a job, really. It wasn't until much later on, obviously, you know, he's not around anymore and people always say about it. I think, do you know what, it's not for a security guy. That's not a bad one to yeah. look after. But at the time, I didn't really, I didn't really appreciate it. But, um, no, I started with... I think it was Kendall Jenner was probably one of the first ones. Yeah. What, what year was this? Or years? Um, so it was quite a bit on. Um, it would have been something like 2015. Right. So, I mean, they were huge at that point. Yeah. I mean, they yeah. Still 15, 16, yeah. something like that. How did the size of that job compare with the size of the Michael Jackson job? It, it wasn't as big, but I don't think anyone's going to be as big as what Michael Jackson no. had. But. Every, everyone I've looked after in my whole career, other than Michael Jackson, I've worked on my own. Oh. So, uh, not including obviously Middle East and all that stuff, but yeah. the stuff in London. Right. So, um, when you say work on your own, there's just you looking just after me. them? Just me, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. So, wow. there's obviously a lot more responsibility. Yeah. There's a lot more to do. And things do have to be managed differently because you're on your own. Does that mean you have more say in where they go? Will they listen um, to you more? Yeah, so the reason why I got on with so many people, I, th I think, is because I was always very liberal on where we went. You know, I, I never, if I honestly thought we could do it and we could do it safely, we would go, and that would mm. be, be the end of it. Yeah. Um, there's some guys, and that's up to them how they do it, but they're slightly more hard line. Right. Um, so, we used to go anywhere, really. The problem with it is, is if, you, if you're... There's one or two places I suggest we don't go. Like? Winter Wonderland. You know, on my own, with an A-list, super A-list celebrity, and you go in somewhere like Winter Wonderland in Hyde Park. Well, as in open... Yeah, yeah, yeah. so, you know, 500 or however many thousands he yeah. got in there. Right. You know, even if we go in covered up with a hood up, because they want to go on a few rides... Yeah and maybe like, buy a bit of candy floss and do whatever you do in these yeah. things, right? Um, that's fine, but I've always got the added worry of, we could probably do that and might get away with it. But if we don't, and we're in the middle of it all, and the hood drops or someone spots, mm. as soon as one person spots them, that's it, it's all over. 
Oh, as in everybody. Everybody, will, yeah. yeah, because everybody, you know what the public like, and we yeah. all do it. If you walk through a shopping centre looking up at the ceiling like that, you look down, you see how many people are looking up at the ceiling. Right. right? And it's the same yeah. effect as that. Um, and now I'm stuck in the middle of somewhere like that on my own. I can't get a car to her because it's too, yeah. too close, uh, sorry, too far away. Um, because that's one of the things I always used to do with celebrities, is keep the car as close as possible at all right. times. Because yeah. you always got a safer place to get to that you knew it was pretty, you know, it was a sterile area yeah. you get to. But somewhere what like What a sterile window, area means, sorry. Just clean, un, 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 uninterrupted, it's all our, all our right. stuff, all yeah. our place, yeah. Um, secure, probably a better way of putting it. Yeah. Um, but somewhere like Winter, Winter Wonderland, or even a stadium, something like that, you're very much stuck in it. Yeah. Now when you've got four or five people with you, that's fine, it's not a big deal. Um, but when you're on your own, there's only so much, it doesn't matter how big you are, there's only so much you can do. And, yeah. and crowd crushing and overzealous fans is probably the biggest problem I ever had right. as a bodyguard in, in Europe or UK. Obviously overseas it's different with code firearms, but in, in the UK I never really had, you know, I didn't have to sort of spring into action or such really. No. Not really. I mean a lot of I used to just talking. I used to just talk. Talk, yeah, to, talk to, to other people? people yeah, when just talk to people, yeah. Ha how? Um, yeah, it just depends what I wanted to do. Well, if I saw something I didn't like, I'd normally move the person I was looking after rather than trying to intervene with the, yeah. you know, someone doing something wrong. I'd just move them away and quite often you'd be two or three people deep away from what you thought was a problem anyway and it's not really a problem anymore. So it, it, you don't need to sort of be pushing and shoving. There are times you might have to push and shove a little bit if it starts getting too busy and it's you know, a little bit dangerous. But generally, I, I used to just, if people said, can I have a photo? I'd just say, look, you can't. I thought, you know, today you can't, I'm sorry, but maybe later, you know, just, I wouldn't just go, no. Yeah. You know, I'll just try and appease everyone. Um, and that always worked for me. I mm. think when people see that you're you know, a sensible person, yeah. they tend to listen a little bit more. So there's a few things that I want to go down, but the first thing I want to talk about is London. Mm because I've got quite a lot of friends who've had very expensive watches nicked off them in central London. So much so now that I have a moon swatch, a meagre moon swatch yeah. in my pocket, yeah. and I put it on when I'm yeah. out. I'll take one off. And I put my Patek in my pocket. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And then I, and I yeah. don't like, uh, and um, I've been warned by a lot of people. Yeah. Has the like, crime in London really gone up since you've been in your job? Oh, massively. Hugely, yeah, hugely. I mean, so I left. I obviously left the industry nearly five or six years ago, but I do still own a private security company, so I'm still quite mm, involved yeah. to a certain extent. Um, yeah, I mean, it just has. You know, even stabbings, shootings are never, they're not mental in this country. Yeah. Shootings still. I mean, it does go on, obviously, but it's not like the states. Um, stabbings have gone through the roof. Really, it's a lot of them doesn't get reported, or you know, it gets reported locally now. Um, and that's about it. And because it's so many, it kind of gets forgotten about quite quickly. Um, watch theft, it's constant. Mobile phone theft, pandemic, really. Really? Um, what do you think's caused all this? Because the police can't do anything. Why not? They haven't got enough of them. Right, <laughs> underfunded. No, we're near, yeah. So yeah. a lot of our places we work as security, or uh, well, my guys work as security, if, the, if the, the venue calls the police for help because something's happened, the first thing they'll say is, haven't you got security? Right, and so go, you're half, sometimes half doing the police's job? Yeah, well, well, often often we supply a lot of extra people because there's not, not going to be any police presence or not a lot, you know. So that's actually quite presence. good for your business. Yeah, it's great, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. With these protests and everything the last few days and that, it's been... Oh, it's what, been, with the um, Israel stuff? Israel, yeah, so we've had a lot of extra people out to look after some of our venues we've had because of that. Right. So it's, it's, it's good for private security, but it also goes to show you, that's why the phones and the watches get stolen, because they know that no one's going to come looking for them. Or get, you know, it's almost impossible to... Uh, I heard 1% of th theft ends up in conviction. Yeah, because it's always last on the list yeah. to, get, to get investigated, really. You know, you think anything, uh, murder's always going to be top, you know. Yeah, but I mean, isn't rape only something like 3%? Yeah, it's not. It's not I probably, mean, that's... Yeah, yeah. It's normally, that's the that's normal thing, if no one's been hurt, this is my opinion, by the way, if no one's been hurt, they won't come. As in obviously physically, physically hurt. hurt. So someone would have to basically be stabbed multiple times. Bleeding out, whatever they yeah. need to be hurt before they will turn up. And it's the same with um, burglaries, you know, it's just a crime number over the phone now. You might get a visit, but it'd be like a week later or something. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if someone's hurt, they will come. They will come. If no one's hurt, 
and it's kind of sounds like it could sort of sorted itself out. They might come, but it might be hours. Same as ambulances, ambulances, same deal. It can take hours to get ambulance. If you're not dying, dying, heart attack or something similar. But even then, if you have a heart attack, it's not easy to get a, an ambulance. You get a first responder who will come out and keep you alive, but you won't get anything that can take, because obviously they drive cars and motorbikes, you won't get anything that can take you away in the back of it. Um, and this isn't... How does that make you feel being born in this country? And yeah, well, changes? I know. And, and the thing is, for our generation, we've seen the change. Because when I was a child, when I was younger, it wasn't like that. So it's happened that quick in one generation, mm. really. It's happened that quick. I don't know what it's like surrounding counties. Obviously, I'm talking about London. Yeah. London's massively, densely populated now with all sorts of nationalities and people, and you know, not just from all over the world, but from all over the country, obviously. You know, yeah. Everything's here. So... Um, but that's where we, that's the fact of where we are. You Do you know? think we're compared to the Middle East? Mm. How is it compared to the Middle East? Is it well, I'm in told terms of danger? Is, well, I'm told it's a lot safer on the streets. I'm told you can leave a 200 gram watch on the table there, and no one no one will nick it. You leave it, and someone will give it back to you. Yeah, that's I mean, I'm told. in Dubai, somewhere like that, yeah. it's probably I mean, it's a lot lot safer. Yeah, a lot lot safer. And it's, why is that? Um, the welfare, I think, they don't have. Um, and the, the, they're more hard line with their... With so their, as in, if you get caught doing that, you're in a lot of trouble? Yeah, yeah, they're more hard line. And, and I, I just think they, they seem to... Dubai's a funny one because it's... In London, we've got wealthy areas. So let's say uh, Mayfair, Knightsbridge, Marleybone, that kind of area. The wealthy area in Dubai is a lot, lot, lot bigger. So because of that, I think that you don't get people... They can't seem to infiltrate. So if we get our watches stolen, or if, if people get um, stabbed for money or mugged or whatever, it's always in that small part of London. No, not always, but quite often it's in that small part of London. Um, whereas in Dubai, it's a lot bigger. So I think, although it may go on, it doesn't feel like it's so much because it's over a lot, you know, Dubai is a lot wealthier area in general. So I, I think that's a lot of the reason that it, it does go on, but I think it's probably easier to police. Right. They've got, obviously got, you know, the country itself is quite a rich country, it's quite a wealthy country. Yeah. So in terms of police and the powers, their laws are going to be, I don't know what their laws are, but I'm sure they're a lot different to what we, we have. Mm. Um, so there's a, there's a whole number of things. Also culture, you know, different world, different countries I've been in, different cultures, with, depending on how people are brought up, how that culture is. To, if you're brought up in the middle of Mexico City, kidnapping probably something that you've heard of quite a lot when you know as you're growing up might not happen to anyone you know but you would it's something would have um you know if you go out to brazil again watch theft or other you know and not to say it's two countries just examples but um so also yeah culture if you go to some countries um you might not if you go to malta i'm sure it's very safe and you mm. get one murder a year or something daft there do you know what mm. i mean so it just depends where you're going really as well do you think um we should be allowed to or not we because mm. i probably wouldn't but would, do you think um, in the UK they should be able to carry guns more? Who? Well, um, <laughs> no one can carry a gun in the UK really, can they? Well, police, think? obviously the police have them, but who else other than the police would you, who are you talking about? Well, like, more like America. Where, where, as in like a normal a civilian, a normal person yeah. can have one in their house and yeah. all that. Uh, no. You don't think they should? No. No. And is, the problem with it is we don't have... Can you carry a gun in the UK? No. No. But you can in other countries? Yeah, it depends so why, on the country. Okay, why can't you here then? Uh, just have different laws. We don't carry, yeah. we don't carry, we don't carry any weapons. So even us. though you're trained to, you can't? Yeah, yeah, no, you still can't. So in America, you can get a, you have to do a, sit a, a shooting test. I don't know what it's called. Um, but to carry a pistol, you basically get a permit and yeah. you can carry a pistol. And a lot of other countries... You mean you in private security or just yeah, anyone? Yeah, no, private security. Yeah. So they, they will be armed, the private security out in those and countries. And would you... Do you think it would be better if you and other private security were armed here, or not better? Uh, I think it would be. Yeah. But the standard of the private security here would need to be higher than what it is for people from me to think people should be carrying firearms. And right. it's not all of them, obviously, because it's yeah. good. But it's the same as the police force. I think they did a poll once about the police force. Um, if they was to arm every police officer and something like. 60 or 70 percent unarmed officers didn't want to be armed. Right. So that's you, you've got to take that into account as well because you don't want someone armed who doesn't want to be armed. When I go abroad and I see the police armed, I'm like, 
yes sir. Oh, no, <laughs> you know, you just like, yeah. and you think a lot of the petty theft, you just saw that and yeah. you're probably not going to fuck about. No. I mean, if you turn up in somewhere like Paris. You yes, can well, I the went US there for the start. Rugby Cup World Cup right, semi-final. They all look like soldiers. They are nutters. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. All of them had massive beards yeah. and they were clearly trained to yeah, never all smile. Phys- all look physically yeah, fit. Yeah, yeah. All the <laughs> protective yeah. knees, things. Um, yeah. The old bang on. Yeah, I know. And I just thought, and you know, if you get grabbed one, you're going to get a smack with something. Right. You know they're going to do that. Yeah. They're going to, you know, because they, they're allowed to. They're, and I'm not, it's a fine line with all that as well. That's the problem with it. And what, because they could take it too far? Yeah, yeah, it's a fine line. And that's, that's the same why people shouldn't have... If you, imagine you was allowed to let everyone have a firearm in their home, but only at home, so you wasn't allowed to walk around it. But maybe then all these um, like burglaries wouldn't happen. They might not, but then what happens... So let's say, like in South Africa, I think, I believe, you used to be able to, I don't know if you can, if someone was on your property and you shot them, that that was all right. If we had that here, the implications that brings is massive. Because if it's a burglar, and I I know that everybody listening, and the same as me really, would think that if a burglar's got on my place and he's in my bedroom and I shoot, shoot them, then you shouldn't be in there, it's tough, you know, bloody blood. And I I, I 100% get that. But with anything, it would have to be guidelines and laws and rules that have got to come with it. Of course. Now, if you shoot the Domino's pizza man who's banged on your door, yeah. and now you're saying, but I, didn't, I, I thought it was an intruder and I, I didn't, because I hadn't ordered the pizza because he's knocked on the wrong door, is that all right? You're ask, if you're asking me, that's not all right. No, exactly. But so if you're asking me if a burglar is in your bedroom that is all right. and your wife is next to yeah. you and your children are in the other bedroom, yeah. you shoot the fuckers. Okay, that's correct, you do. Uh, like However, I'm, I'm feeling yeah, like, yeah, I'm no, feeling yeah, like yeah. that now. So By the, the way, I'm not very knowledgeable on this. I'm, I'm, <laughs> you, you're more knowledgeable than me. So the point of that is... Do you, do you agree with what I've said, that the yeah, difference... Yeah, no, totally, but yeah. that's good because you've got two differences there. You've now got 90% of people will agree with us on that one, I'm sure. But also you've got the poor Domino's pizza guy. So now, when the guy, your girlfriend's ex-boyfriend comes up to the door and you shoot him, do you see where we're going? Yeah, like, hey, surely he deserves it. No, do you see what I mean? There's well, a, it isn't, but aren't all laws, aren't there, grey in all laws? No, there is. the opposite with, like, do you remember the guy, I think it was in St Ives, it was quite close to me, he, he shot... He's in, he went to prison for a long time. He shot intruders and yeah. he went to prison for like 15 years. Yeah, yeah. I think it was because he shot them in the back. Um, but like they came and robbed an old man's house. Yeah, oh no, I yeah, know, yeah. yeah. Like, because yeah. also, have you not got to think about what message that sends out to everyone else? What, what, what it would be interesting to see is, hypothetically, if that law was passed and everyone had it, it'd be interesting to see how many people got shot for burglary and how many got, people got shot who shouldn't have. Mm. That would be the interesting, and I don't like to say it, but I suspect more people will get shot because they shouldn't have than they will get for burglary. I mean, how is it, in, uh, there was a case in America recently, wasn't there, where someone got shot on, on the doorstep? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, you'd start, like anything, you start, people would start looking for loopholes, it's going to make, it just, it just, the problem with it is, is when you think about firearms, and, and for people like, you and me and many people. I mean, I shouldn't have a gun. Well, no, but many people watching, because you think like a normal person or in in the correct manner, having a firearm is probably quite safe. But you've got to remember, not everyone's the same as ours. So would you you rather have everyone in the home has a gun and they protect their own property or um, theft is... 1% 1% conviction rate. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what I think you should be able to do, which, which is a, I think is a compromise for this country, and the reason why um, it would be a good thing, because firearms isn't a big thing in this country, mm. compared to, if you compare it to somewhere like the States, is you should be able to, the same as you can if you've got a squatter in a, in a residential property, you should be able to remove them and do whatever that, that means. Stabbing someone or shooting someone when they've come to burgle your house, although it would feel like the right thing to do, you're taking a life for someone who wants to take a watch. And that's where the problem comes. If you've got someone taking a life, you've got a knife. A well, again, your, again, your wife's or your son's. And, and, and this is the right. thing, isn't it? If your wife's already been shot and you're about to go next and you do something, I'm sure that when it comes to court, um, you know, in all the different parameters of what's happened that day or night, then that's all going to be taken into account for mm. and it's going to be seen as self-defence. Yeah. If a guy just jumps over your back garden fence, decides to nick your Buddha 
out on the patio <laughs> and you shoot him in the head. No, he can have the Buddha. <laughs> he can have the Buddha, you mate. Shoot him, yeah. You shoot him in the head. <laughs> no, take, he could have a leg shot for that. <laughs> do, you see what I mean? do, do, do you see what I mean by the judgment, though? Yeah, no, you I shoot do. him in the head and now you've got a problem. Well, but the law states, if they come onto my property, I'm allowed to shoot him. Yeah, but come, you know, you're yeah. just nicking a Buddha, mate. Mm. So it's not as clear cut no. as what I'm trying to say. And I, and I 100% agree with you. But that's for plain, simple, clear, normal thinking. Yeah, yeah. But it'd probably be quite safe to have it under, where, in your drawer by your bed, because you'd probably never get it out in your life, because you ne wouldn't need to. It'd be there for the day if you did. Mm. And if you did, you wouldn't be blasting everything what moves around the house. You'd probably be quite clear that there's someone in your kitchen with a knife mm. before you shoot him. And even then, you might choose to shoot him in the legs or somewhere to put him down rather than straight between the eyes. Mm. Other people, it's so easy, once you get into that, that position of guns in everyone's house and laws of being able to, it's so easy to be able to exploit that, yeah. that it will be lots and lots and lots of people, and there is in the States, killed yeah. un un unlawfully. And well, people all the school will be, shootings and all that, how easy it is to get away. Right, gun. exactly. And then on top of that, people, some people won't get away with it because they'll say, well, he clearly wasn't. Um, he's got a door keys, your house mate, you, yeah. you know. But, but there will be a lot of people who get away with shooting people, but, but shouldn't have. Or it's got to be, you've got to get away with it because it's, it's a manslaughter charge, not a murder because it's a mistake. But mm. you still killed someone. Yeah. And I think at the moment that it's, if you could give a firearm to only the right person, and no one knows if you're the right person because anything can happen to anyone in their life where things change for mm. them, unfortunately. Um, so there's no way of doing that. A test or a firearms test or even a mental health test, it's not going to help. No. Because you just don't know, you know even we sit here now in, in, in no more than 10 years' time, something can slowly change and we start putting our clothes on back the front and don't mm. know what we're doing. It's, it's, it's open to any human being for things to go wrong. So I just think all the time we don't have to have it. Yeah. Don't. And how do we therefore then, if, we, if, we, if the gun laws are going to stay the same here, mm. how do we get that conviction rate of theft and rape way up? Uh, police officers. More of them? It's got to be. It's got to be. We, it's almost double, I would say. That's, you think and we need twice as many? I, 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 at least for a certain period of time, because until w w when something's too far gone, you've got to bring it back. Yeah. And you can't bring it back with the standard people you'd normally had if you kept it there in the first place. So you need more. Yeah. You, know, you always need more of it and you need to bring it right back before you can sit it back to where it is. So just put in police officers another X amount on the streets and maybe what we should have had at the beginning, it's probably not going to bring us back still. No. It might help a little bit, but it's not going to say so you'd have to flood it. Are there any countries you think that are doing better than us in this regard? Oh, hundreds. Most, most of Europe. Right. I mean, the firearms what? laws, they all carry fire. The police in, where was I the other day? I was in Spain. I was at Marbella Film Festival the other day. Just the, Oh my lion. I was in Barcelona, sorry, not, not the right. time before I was in Barcelona. Yeah. And the store detect the store guy who stands on the he had a gun. And he was in a like a you know, a, like a John Lewis kind of store. Mm. Um, and he had a he had a firearm. Well I'm not again not suggesting that it's a thing to do, but they're always gonna be miles in front. Or they've got battens hanging down. Yeah. In fact I nearly got the watch taken off me in Barcelona. Really? They picked the wrong guy yeah, for that. <laughs> yeah, I was with a friend of mine and we saw him before we even got out of the taxi. And where we was oh, so you figured out they were going to do it before they did it? Before we even got out of the cab, yeah. And we, we was walking down a pedestrianised bit to go into this How did you recognise them? How did you know they were... They just looked. They kept looking, looking at us too, oh, far too much. And they right. were almost pointing and waving. Yeah. And we, as we started to walk down, it was a, quite a wide alleyway, but it was an alleyway. They followed us, three of them. Um, and I said to my mate, I said, look, we're go let's get a bit closer to the club first. Yeah. I said, well, let's just turn around onto them and just see what they do really what like um, stare them out or yeah something? just see what they do because we can't keep you know i was yeah. like gonna jump on from behind yeah. us so um but just as we turn around one of the doormen had clocked it as well one of the spanish doormen and he had an asp expend expend uh, expendable asp an asp it. is what like a baton yeah a baton yeah, yeah. and he, he flicked it out because he saw him and saw what was going to happen and he come out to kind of help us as soon as they saw him they run back off up the road um, there you go then. But once again, you know, the doorman, we can't, the doorman in this country can't have anything like that. Um, but the training, uh, you know, and the use of it, it's all got to come along with it. You can't just sort of hand one out and go, there you go. No. Um, and that guy he didn't have it on him neither. He had it in his bag um, yeah. out of the way and obviously just used it on the odd occasion like that. So it wasn't always readily available. If someone upset him, he could just hit him with it. Mm. It wasn't really like that. But he did have the use of it for should something like that happen. Yeah. And it worked.
Yeah. I mean, they're quite opportunist wow. out there. They're not up for a fight anyway, really, places no. like that. So if you put up a bit of resistance, they're probably not bothered. But um, quite often they bump into you and take it off your wrist without you even knowing. Yeah, well, I, I know a couple of people, especially yeah. um, Richard Meal. They have some of the yeah. clubs you can just flick them. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and they open quite wide yeah. when you flick them. Yeah. Like some of them just like that. Yeah, that's it, and they just flick straight off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and they're good at it because they do it every day. Right. I had one not so long ago on the tube, London Underground. I was stood by the door with my arm down by the side, and a guy, I could see him here. I always see things to about here. I can see that pretty right. much. Um, and he come up to the door. Two guys got on. I was the only one standing in the door, so the door was clear. And I thought, why has he not got on? Does he, f I'm not in the way, he can just walk around me. And I, I looked at him, and he put his bag down right by where the door's shut. And I, mm. and I thought, oh, you want my watch? So I put my arm up here, because I didn't want it near him. And then he looked up at me, and I looked down at him like that, and he just picked his bag up and walked off. Right. And all he would have done is slipped it off my wrist, just as you hear the did 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 on the doors going. Because the doors would have shut, it would have been in his hand, I wouldn't be able to do anything about it. So the guy wouldn't have needed to run off. He wasn't violent, he wasn't knife no. you know, or anything like that. But he would have slipped that off with my arm there, he would have slipped it off. And then the doors would have closed and that would have been the end of it. He right. could have waved at me almost with my watch on. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so yeah. cheeky bastard. Yeah, yeah, he didn't have to run out or anything. So, so um, here's but, something on that oh, real quick. This is completely random, yeah. but um, this is an IWC. And I called this about three years ago. An IWC, the first watch that I've seen do it. You can now get digital ownership with an IWC, where right. you register it online, all the paperwork, the history and everything is digitally online. So if someone nicks this, yeah. that is assigned to me digitally now and therefore probably worth a, a bit less. Is that not something that watch brands could do or put trackers in them? Yeah, you can. The problem is, like anything else, it, it, it trackers in cars now. It's, just, it's not stopping them getting stolen. You know, all these things, anything, anything you do, it's only a matter of time, unless you keep progressing in that technology all the time, it's only a matter of time. Um, that someone will come up with some airbrain idea of how to get around but, it. But that's, that's not a reason not to try and no, it's make not. it more safe, No, it's is not. It? But once again, okay, so you've got a tracker on it, right? And then it goes, your watch gets taken off, you've got a tracker on it, and it's pinging up in Japan. Who's, who's going to get that for you? Well, maybe you. <laughs> you yeah. But it's just fine if you can afford. Yeah, you <laughs> you know what I mean? It might be more than the more watch. More than the watch. Get the exactly, watch. That's what, and, that, and that's the yeah. thing with it again. But does that not, I say, you don't think it would be a deterrent? All, all you do is you move the watch further away. Don't sell it in London. Go and sell it in you know somewhere else. Have a, have a watch dealer in LA where, where yeah. you just know that if someone sees it, it's just not going to bother. Yeah, I mean, there's ways around everything if you yeah. think about it long enough, and that's that's the problem with it. So, is it a deterrent? Maybe a little bit, but realistically, it'd only get to a stage that you know if you steal a nice watch, it's got a tracker on it. You're going to know that. I saw yeah. a car, brand new BMW, three months old, the other day, get stolen instantly. Did you? And the guy walked up to it with his mate, they put a box somewhere on it. So we obviously have one of these electrical things that does the doors. It's an electric car, fully electric. Um, to the extent I wasn't even sure if they sold it, uh, they, they stole it because it all happened so quick and like right. efficiently. You didn't really see any windows breaking and no. doors and all that. Um, and then he, the other guy jumped back and got in his car that they turned up in the first place. The, the, the guy with the box walked round to the door, opened the door. I thought, oh wow, <coughs> they're in it. Okay, let's see how long it takes them to start it. Shuts the door, gone. Literally, press the button, gone. I think the whole thing from turning up to doing that to leaving, 15 seconds. Wow. And that's a brand new car, so it should have brand new technology on it. Yeah. You know, with all the bells and whistles for tracking, and it might have a tracker on it, and uh, they know that, they rip, them to, they rip them apart for trackers, but, you know, that'd be on a container out to somewhere in Africa by the morning. Yeah. So, some, not just car companies, but in general, you know, even alarm company, intruder alarm companies, houses, some, people, some companies are better than others and they're more onto it than others. But it's never, it's never over for them and never find a fix because every time they get mm. a fix, it'll only be even until it's not a fix anymore. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be an ongoing thing. AI is going to be the same problem. How? Massively. You what do you mean? It. Well, at the moment, we've got AI on. TV and you can get apps where you can make up company videos with an AI person talking and they all right. look exactly. What yeah. about when we go further than that? And it's not that far away when you get AI people <laughs> or you can put AI people into video cameras. You know, you can change video for CCTV footage. You've got to do all of that over as time goes on. 
where I could put your face on a CCTV footage of robbing a bank and then it goes up in court and it's you and you're going, but it wasn't me. But it is you, I can clearly see it. At the moment, it's a CCTV footage of a clear picture is enough to put, you know, if you've done something wrong, is enough to get you... Um, so does AI scare you? AI is a far bigger problem. It doesn't scare me because it, realistically, at my age, it's not going to get to a place probably where it's going to be a huge problem. I mean, already I think uh, actors are, a, um, in, in, particularly in the States, but it's across the board, I think, are um, striking at the moment mm. because due to the use, well, one of the reasons is yeah. due to the use of AI. Um, it, yeah, it's going to get worse. Of course, it's going to, it's, we, we seem to be developing it more. We're all putting all our money into global warming and emissions and all this. AI will have us dead long before global warming, if we're yeah. not careful, I can assure you of that. Well, Elon Musk said he thinks that AI is a worse threat than nuclear it's got, weapons. It's got to be, it's got to be, because the speed it's getting... And what I don't understand is the people developing this stuff know the potential of it, but they're still cracking on with it, sort of free willy. Mm. Which I just find a bit strange, but... So your job, does it not make you... Trust no one. Does it not make you sceptical as fuck? Because, uh, I mean, this has been a great uh, conversation, but yeah. it's not been that positive yet. No, it? it's no, not. No. I, 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 um, I'm quite a good judge of character. Within 10, or not even 10 minutes, within five minutes talking to someone, I, I, I quite often know if I'm going to get on with you. Um, quite often know if I'm going to you know, like you as a, an ongoing friend or, or whatever. Um, but I'm also very good at if I don't warm to someone, it takes me seconds and I think, mm. and I don't know what that is, but that's not me thinking it, I feel that, but I'm not really, you know, I'm not really warming them, and why not? You know, I like most people, there's not many people I don't like, so on the other occasion I come across someone, it's not I don't like them, but you know, you're not sure about them and you think, mm, I've got to be a bit careful of you. I, I always sense that and very rare have I been wrong, now I'm sure at times I have, but very rare have I been wrong, so... And what are the big red flags of people if you meet them? Um, what, what gets you on your back? So work, working as a bodyguard, I always look at what people are wearing, look at how they're standing, look at what, what they're doing. Are they on their own? Have they got a bag? Are they with someone else? Are they on a phone? Do they seem to be looking around far too much given the place that they're, we're in? You know, if you've got someone who's um, looking, looking around quite a lot and they're in Howard's, then you probably expect to see that. If you've got someone who's looking around quite a lot, but he's in the cinema, you should be looking forward, really. Mm. You know, so yeah. you can depends on where you are and what you're doing. And I notice these things quite quickly when I'm out with my girlfriend, and that she always knows when I notice someone. You know, and we walk past. We was in Soho the other night, and we walk past someone. I just, I see all the drug dealers. I can just see them. They're, right. they're a mile off. You know, all the all the wrong and up to no good. Yeah, I can see them a mile off, um, and that's just time. Seventeen years I was doing that for, mm. um, and. I, I do it when I'm out on my own, not intentionally, if you know what I mean, I'm not, I'm not bothered, but I still do it without realising probably, like the guy on the, with the watch on the thing, I just noticed him straight away. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's a whole, it's not one thing that makes you recognise these people, it's, it's a whole list of things. You know, for me, why didn't he get on? Well, I didn't, I didn't really even see what the guy looked like, but the fact that he didn't get on already put alarm bells to me. Yeah. Where has he gone? Because he was there, he's now not there. So now he's down there. You know, all these little things. Why has he put his bag down there? What's he getting out of his bag? Like, to get, get on the train, then get something out of your bag. Mm. All in a split second, that's all in my mind. This isn't right. Right. It's like, literally straight away. So I know, so already I'm doing things to combat what's, what's happening there. And in this case, I put my arm up so it's further away from him. And then I thought, well, that's not going to be enough, so I'm going to make sure that I know that he's seen me. And then after that, we'll have to see what happens, you know, what he does, because I can't preempt what he's going to do as such. Yeah. And obviously, he just picked his bag up and walked off, so that was the end of that. But it's, it's a whole manner of things what are happening at the time, and you have to decide what you want to do. Do you get off? You could have got off and run. You could have screamed. You know, there's loads of things you mm. can do. Yeah. Um, I just try and de-escalate everything as quick as possible, even on my own. You know, even if I'm not, more so if I'm looking after someone because we don't, you don't want the fuss. But even if I'm out, you know, out with your girlfriend, out with your family. Uh, what do you mean by de-escalation? Well, if you see something happening, just do whatever you need to do to try and sort of stop it from happening. But so many years ago now, I was, my parents lived down in Eastbourne, so they pop up to London to see me sometimes. Um, we was over near the Shard building somewhere and we walked around the corner because we'd just come out of there and there was a, f a pub there 
Um, and it was obviously a football pub because they were all out, you know, it's just rammed with blood. And I said to my mum, you know, I said, let's cross the road. And she said, she said, no, no, we just got, she said, why do you want to cross the road? Because we, we had to be that side. I said, because you don't want to walk through, mm. you know, 30, and I thought if it only takes one of them to grab my mum or something, I'm going to get upset because, yeah. you know, and then all of a sudden it's me with 80 football fans, you know. Yeah. So I said, just go across the road, walk past, and it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a thing. Mm. And I always think like that. Because if I was looking after someone, if something was to happen, it's me who's got to sort it out. Mm. So I would always think, let's do that because I know pretty much nothing's going to happen. Whereas my parents' way of thinking is, oh, they won't touch this now. And oh, they might not, but what if they do? Yeah. And it's me there now, well, am I going to let that happen? Am I, gonna let, you know, am I just going to go, oh, don't worry about it? It just rips your bag off your arm or whatever might have happened. You know, so I always, anything I do, including myself, if I'm out on my own at night and I see something I don't like, I cross the road, just go yeah. down the other way. I could walk past, maybe because of the size of me, people won't, but what if they did? Why do I even want the hassle of, yeah. do you know what I mean? It's just recognising what's going on around you. Anyone who wears earphones in London should be shot. Why? It's so dangerous. I get up right behind women with bags open and they don't even know I'm there when you're trying to get past them in and the street. And they've got earphones on. Earphones in, you think, why are they not even there? And you see they've got their earphones in. Some people are texting away as they're walking along. <coughs> um, yeah, I mean, you should just, on bikes, on those bikes you can pay for and they've got earphones on, no helmet, yeah. no reflective clothes, you know, and they're all over the road. And you just think, to not know in this, in this city particularly, not, not know any capital city really, what's going on around you, it's just, you're asking for trouble. Mm. Because that's what the thieves will go for straight away. Right. If you've got a phone out in your hand and you've got earphones in, they know already you're looking at something and there's every chance, not always, but there's every chance you might be listening to something as well. So a motorbike what comes up onto the pavement, you're not going to hear it. You're looking at one small screen, so you can't see anything here at all. And especially if you're doing an email or text message, you're now listening, watching and thinking about what you're writing. You just forget it, it's yeah. all over, you've got yeah. no chance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I see it day in, day out on the streets. Day in, day out, every day, even coming here. You know, I just see it all the time. And even if you've got them in because your phone's going to go, you know, or it might go, or you just leave it in for the phone, you're still blocking your hearing. Right. You still just don't, if you don't need it, put it away, put your, put your phone in your handbag, zip your handbag up, put it in a jacket pocket you can zip up. Yeah. You know, just put everything away securely. Right. Quite often in your jacket, have it around your front if you can, if you've got front pockets. Um, so, you, you know, you, you're a bit closer to you, you can feel it's there. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a lot of amount of times I try to walk past people because I'm walking quicker. Yeah. And I get right up the backside of them and you think, Jesus. Right. Oh, I could, this would take, be I could easy. do anything I wanted yeah. to do, literally anything. And I can be there for a minute, as long as a minute sometimes. Wow. Totally oblivious to the fact that you're even, even there. You know, mm. I'm a big guy with a, a small, you know, young woman there with a bag open, oh, absolutely annihilate her in a second. Yeah. And you've been walking behind her that far for a second until you can get past, get past mm. her. And I just think, how oh, dangerous is yeah. And it is, it is dangerous. And we always work in this country on the whole, oh, well, it hasn't happened to me and it probably won't, sort of thing. You know, that's something that happens to other people. It all happens in a second. Right. Absolute second, you know, it, before you even know it, it's your bag's ripped off your arm, your phone's been ripped out your hand. You know, I've seen quite a lot of people with their phones been taken out of their hands. Yeah. Motorbikes come up on the pavement and they've just got on the back, just takes it out and it's gone, that's it. You're yeah. not going to do anything. Wow. Does this give you trust issues? Like, do when you I walk funda around. Fundamentally not trust anyone? Not in my. Um, not in my business life or no, sort of it, it pays life. you not to trust anyone. Outside, when I'm walking around, I don't trust anyone. Right. Not in this town. Maybe, um, but even in, in, like I say, I'm from Eastbourne. If I went into the town centre in Eastbourne, although not very big, yeah. I, I'm always the same. I Do they ever I cause issues in your relationships? Like, have you ever had what, like a girlfriend? Yeah. Ever thought a girlfriend is cheating on you? No, you? no. No, that's no. what I mean. No, I'm not. I'm quite. I'm not. Um, that's borderline paranoid, isn't it? <laughs> well, I mean, your job could make you that. Because ever yeah. since I learned about how the banking system works and how the money system works, definitely made me more sceptical and paranoid about the world. I, I do keep going. a very open mind. Right. Um, the thing with me, I'm quite black and white. So, and it's not always a you are or you're not solution. But quite often I, I, I am like that. And I always think you can trust people until you have a reason not to. Right, yeah. Someone else said that to me. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's why... That's, Actually, I'm talking, someone said to me, I won't trust someone until you give me a reason to trust you. I mean, uh, <laughs> that, you could argue that is another way of doing it, yeah. which, which, you know, 
if if you did it that way, any sensible, decent person you're going to be around for probably not that long amount of time, you will do something with them where you, you need an element of trust from them. Mm. And it doesn't mean lending them money and they're paying it back. It could just be something you say, oh, this so and so, don't, don't say nothing though. No. Yeah. That's now trust straight away. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, so um, do you ever test people, like give them a little secret that they might? No, I'll tell, no, you, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what I do though, is I give people one chance. Oh, really? One chance and, and, and then it's and, done? And you, you won't see, yeah, you can go away, I'm not interested. Really? And I'm very stubborn with that. Wow. Yeah, because I, I wouldn't do it. And I know you should never, you shouldn't judge people by what you would do, even if you're, if you're the perfect human being, because not everyone's the same and people yeah. do different things. But I, you know, when it comes to, so obviously, you know, with businesses and like yourself, you know, money's not, um, Money's not my motivator. I like being um, successful. That's, a, that's the bit I really enjoy out of all of it. And obviously, if you're successful, you can be successful in anything. Um, you can be a successful cake maker. Do you know what I mean? You can be a, su a successful golfer. Um, but obviously, being successful in business quite often means that you're going you're gonna to make a lot of money because that's the nature of the, the mm. job you're in. But for me, um, I'm more about principle and loyalty you know if you say you're going to do something you're going to do it and i'm like it's all i've got a lot of people who work for me now and i'm like that if you're not going to do it just tell me you're not going to do it I, it's fine I, but I, I need to know you're not don't say you're going to do it and not do it hmm. and it's a simple it's and I, I keep it very open like that. i don't i never like people to feel that they can't tell me they, they don't want to or they're not going to do something and if it's a, if they don't want to we'll have a talk about it and maybe you might teach me something maybe yeah. i shouldn't have asked you to do that and you're right do you know what i mean so mm. and, that, and that's how i normally i keep it like that until i have reason not to with everything i do yeah with everything i do mm. has any one of your a-list clients completely ignored an important request you made of them uh or been very difficult yeah, to once who and how and what um i mean it's all over the internet so i'm telling you anyway so i was looking after bella at one stage bella hadid, hadid yeah. yeah and uh we i think there's a free palestine march right on grosvenor square in london and she just wanted to get out and be sort of part of it for a little bit mm. and obviously at the time we'd just come from another event we was in a rolls royce she was in a ball gown and yeah, we weren't we weren't protest ready. Yeah, we weren't <laughs> protest ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was in a suit, you know. I love was, that. But military you know, speak, we yeah, weren't yeah, protest, protest ready. ready. Um, the, you know, the driver was all out on and the worst of it. Yeah. It was a Rolls Royce, whatever it was, you know, Phantom or I don't know, it's a big thing. Mm. Um, and I just thought, you know, she's in a ball gown, hills. Mm. And I said, I'm on my own. You can't get you out into this. And she's so. This went backwards and forwards in the car. So she's quite headstrong, was she? On that respect, yeah. yeah. Normally, nine times out of ten, she's very good. I used to yeah. love working with Bella because she was great. You know, yeah. it's very rare where I wouldn't say she couldn't do something anyway. But on the on the times I said it's probably not a good idea, she'd listen and we wouldn't do it. But on that particular time, she just really wanted to get involved in it. I know she's got some connection with her. I'm not, I'm not you know, totally a fair about it or works with her and that. But I know there's some connection with it. I think possibly her father maybe or her, her, her family background. But... Um, so she wanted to do it and it went backwards and forwards in the car and I remember looking forward thinking I've said no enough times now and it's she's never doesn't normally do this I was thinking well w very quickly and if we're going to do it in my head I was thinking if we're going to do it what what's the best way to do it and, I, and anything like that for me is dip in dip out so you're there people suddenly oh look it's Bella and then no more than a minute later you, you, gone. you're gone again but you've done what you need to do so I said look I, I will do it but I will I want hold of you all the time. You literally were physically hold holding her. her. Yeah, because as soon as you get one or two people in, that's it. You know, in a protest, you're talking to hundreds of people in one space. It's if I, you see it in films and stuff where people are trying to get hold of people and their hands interlock and all of a sudden, yeah. you know, it's, it's a bit, it is, it is like that in a protest. Right. Um, so I didn't want to let go of her because I wouldn't be able to pull her back or push her to a car. You can get disoriented. I've, I've worked in a lot of protests in the past with ITV reporters and, BBC and people like that looking after them when they've been like a G20 summit and things like that. So I knew I know how quick these things can escalate, get out of control. You get disorientated quite quickly as well when you're in crowds. Bearing in mind she's not from here anyway, she probably doesn't know where she is anyway. So I didn't want I didn't want to lose her. You know I didn't want to not have physical contact with her. So I said look we we'll get out, but we're going to do it. I'm going to keep hold of you. Not not mm. too rigorously, but you know some 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 contact somewhere. Yeah. Um, 
and then we're gonna get back in the car. And that's it, and she went, okay. So I thought, right, so we've gone from not wanting to do it at all, to not just getting out and doing it, we've kind of got the, got in the bit, you know, the bit in the middle. And as soon as we got out, we went in, no one really noticed for about 30 seconds, then they did, I had hold of her the whole time. And then I just said to a couple of the police, because there's a lot of police following the protest, to just do us a favour and just, and they could see where it was, mm. so they were quite happy to help. Yeah. Um, and then literally no more than two minutes, I think, maximum, which seems like quite a long time. But, uh, I said, right, we're going now. And she just went, right, because she'd done what she wanted to do. We got back in the car. And um, the other thing you've got to bear in mind as well is, you know, rich and famous doesn't always bode well with certain people. You know, and who do you think you are turning up in a Rolls Royce to my protest? In a ball gown. Right. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because yeah. they don't know where we just come from. No. Um, so you have to bear, bear in mind that people may could turn on you just because of you know other things like that. Yeah. So I, I, that was all a concern, other than just getting trampled on or something happening that shouldn't. And I'm on my own. Um, but that was the best I could manage. That had I, if I really had the choice, would I have done it? No, no chance. Mm. Never would have got out of the car. No. Mm. But at the end of the day, what what do I do? You, you you can't keep someone in a car. You can't lock them in. No. You know, and if they if they get out. And because that's where we was getting to with it, I, yeah. I, had, I, I felt like I had a choice of agreeing with it, or she was just going to get out anyway and yeah. have no one with her. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So I just had to very quickly put together a plan in my head, which was going to be the safest and quickest way to do it on my own. Mm. And that's what we did, and it worked fine. Yeah, it was all over the press, and obviously as you can imagine, but it worked fine. But yeah, I mean that's the only time. The rest of the times particularly in the Middle East and that, you, if you say it's not a good idea to go there, you won't go there. Right. Because, you know, death's obviously the yeah. knocking. But, um, yeah, that's probably about the only time, I think. And even then, I managed to manage it to just about doable experience. Mm. <laughs> Have you... Um, there's films like The Bodyguard, yeah. you know, the famous Kevin Costner one, yeah. and then there's a, a huge series in the UK called The Bodyguard. Are these yeah. real, like true to real life, or are they just Hollywood... So it, not. I, I haven't seen all that BBC. Was it BBC? Yeah, the no, BBC I haven't, I haven't one seen was all that. One. And it, it's like one of the best yes. things for the year or whatever. And um, I watched a little bit. We got to remember: is anything film and TV? Um, it's got to be watchable. Now, ninety percent of what a bodyguard does, probably waiting around. <laughs> yeah. do, do, do you know what I mean? Sat in a car or sat outside a hotel room waiting yeah. to go. So, so if you actually did what we did on a daily basis, you'd have to watch about four box sets <laughs> yeah. before any action. Yeah. So um, they were kind of yeah. I mean, a lot of what the the, the, the guys do in both those films, even though the Kevin Costner one's very old now. Mm. Um, you know, because he works on Kevin Costner works on his own within within that movie, and he's yeah. kind of an individual bodyguard to an, an A-list singer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean they're not bad. They're not, yeah. not going to be, but nothing films bang on, nothing TVs bang on to what he was trying to portray. Mm. But um, by and large, I didn't think it was too bad. I also had a good advisor on it because yeah. a lot of the stuff, it, it, the stuff they was doing good, some of it far fetched, but it's TV. You got. Yeah. You know, you, in in those films. The bodyguard ends up sleeping with the celebrity. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, if no. only that would be great. Yeah. No. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. that seems so unprofessional. Um. <laughs> oh, there's a story in um, there. Come on. Yeah, it does. It does seem very unprofessional. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And that's why I was a professional bodyguard for 17 years, or right. whatever we've done it. <laughs> that's why. Yeah. Yeah, that was the question. I wanted to pad around the whole yeah. thing, but actually ask. But. Yeah, no, I mean, that is, you know, it, it has happened. I think uh, J-Lo or Beyonce, was it J or something? Oh. I think she married her body, right. I think. And there's probably a few others that have, but I didn't really spend long enough time with anyone. No. To, I mean, how much you need? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> speed dating. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I was, do you know what? I, 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 <laughs> I always laugh about it because, you know, I used to get on with a lot of people over the years and that, but... This is one of the reasons why I stopped being a bodyguard. First of all, because of doing all things like I do with you. Know, I've done, done a lot of this now, podcasts and different things. Um, and although we talk about celebrities all the time, the only reason why we really talk about the celebrities is because I'm not giving anything away. You know, they're all over the media. If I said to you, Tom Cruise had a bodyguard, would you be surprised? You know what I mean? So you're not mm. giving anything away. Yeah. I'll never talk about the celebrity themselves in terms of, you know, what he's doing in the morning and all. You know, just, mm. just, 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 you just wouldn't. But, Although that's an industry thing, you wouldn't. I wouldn't 
about my mates or anyone else. Not, do you know what I mean? I just wouldn't yeah. do that. So talking about celebrities, but obviously in between the celebrities, there's a lot of other people I've looked after that I don't talk about because they are businessmen, um, CEOs of banks, right. um, maybe you know, Middle Eastern royalty, um, all different times, scientists, sometimes you know, pharmaceutical industry, corporate, you know, all the corporate stuff. Yeah. Um, you get involved in all that in between all the celebrity stuff. It's not celebrities constantly. Um, but because they're not in the public light, then they shouldn't be bought. You know, it's not for me to bring people like that into the public light. So yeah. I stopped doing it because obviously with the filming, the acting, um, all this stuff, I was becoming more and more known. And the last thing I wanted to do was go out and be somewhere and sort of someone recognises me and I'm not with the person I'm with. You know, it's just, it's just not the right. conflict it's of interest. A, yeah, you now like, you're more media. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not it's not the right thing to do. The other thing is I've done everything I wanted to do in that time. I, I did, I did anti-piracy for quite a number of years on the oil tankers. Right. Um, protecting oil tankers from the, the pirates out on the coast oh, wow. of Somalia. Um, Any close moments there? Uh, yeah, a few, not too bad. I mean, when I first started that, we weren't armed, but as time went on, we was armed. So when we became armed, it wasn't, it, you know, it was quite a bit easier. Yeah. Um, but that was that, that wasn't me away all the time. I would go away for like ten days a month or something, do that, come back, and not do mm. another one until next month. Um, but yeah, I, I, I did that for two years probably. Yeah. On and off. There's a whole there's a whole range of jobs I've done. There isn't anything I didn't want to do, and I thought I've exhausted. Once I've exhausted something, and I want to do something else, if I decide that I'm doing it, that's it. Mm. It's over, and I won't go back. No, you know, and I'll say I've still got a private security company now, but I only I'm in, I'm in the office. So I, you know, new contracts. I don't really get involved in operations or um, anything like that at all now. Um, so, what's your future then? Future for me. Mm. Um, I feel like I've grown out of security now, to be honest. Life's moved on quite a bit for me outside of, outside of the security world. Like I've mentioned, I've got a business that does still make me good revenue, which is the reason why it's still there, really. But um, predominantly, I like to get away from it altogether, I think, in the long run. And do what? Um, just carry on with the acting. Yeah. So I've been acting for, with film, um, which is always an ongoing thing anyway, really, in the background, if you like. Yeah. Um, and then my clothing brand. I've got a clothing brand which has just been launched. Right. Um, and just to yeah, literally sort of bring that up. Why why launch a clothing brand? Um, it's kind of a little bit off the back of security, a little bit. I, I many years ago when I looked after Bella, I was put in Vogue magazine for being the real style star London Fashion Week. Right. Um, and I had a bomber jacket on, and I've always worn bomber jackets. Now at the time they were for a different company. Uh, well, I'm not going to say because I've got my own. Now, <laughs> but. <laughs> but um, and I, was, I got reported a lot in Vogue and Elle and all the fashion magazines because of it, uh, which is kind of actually how all this PR side of stuff started, really. Um, and I just thought, well, one day I'm going to make my own. Why am I wearing someone else's? I'm going to make my own. Um, and before COVID, I looked at doing it all, and obviously it wasn't a good time. Yeah. Uh, then I started again back to this year, uh, and we've just, we just made three... Uh, three different colours. What's the brand it's, called? So we can... uh, Simon Newton London. So it'd be SimonNewtonLondon.com. Right. If you want to, if you want to have a look, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're nice. See, I'm not going to say that. They're mine, aren't they? But, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, they're not nice. In fact, yes. Ah. So I mean, that's a little bit different to yeah. what, what you would normally. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, on the back. Right. And is this aimed sort of street fashion or is this aimed more for people who are in security? So, no, so it is street fashion. So yeah. I, what I've gone for is more of a middle market where I wanted something which was, it looked expensive, but more affordable. Yeah. Um, because I think sometimes you don't have to spend a lot of money to look, to look good. And quite often when I, I used to always sort of be careful what I wore when I was a bodyguard. And, and I got to a stage with some what people. What do you mean, be careful? Well, just always look, like, look smart, make sure I was wear, wearing the right clothing for right. the day sort of thing, yeah. um, rather than just turn up in a black suit every time. Mm. Um, and people used to say to me, it's all right for you, you can afford it. You can afford all these right. suits. Mm. And I said, but it does, I'm, I'm wearing a Debenham suit mm. with a Debenham's tie and my m and sock. I haven't got anything, but it's all about the colours. The fit. One of the things I used to do was spend an extra £30 on tailoring the jacket. Yes. Yeah. Straight away, it looks like a totally different suit. Mm. Um, so that that kind of got me on to thinking, 
back then, because I've always quite liked fashion, um, things don't, you don't need to spend two and a half grand on a bomber jacket to, to have a red lining in it. Yeah. Because a lot of the, the, the mega expensive ones, they will have a red lining, all the cheap ones got orange ones in. Um, and so it goes on, do, mm. do, do you know what I mean? So I, I wanted to try and get people into, male and female, into being able to, and we're not there yet because it's all, it's all still quite new and there's gonna be a lot more stuff coming out over the course of next year. Um, experience, if you want to call it that, and want to be wearing nice, I wanted a jacket that you put on, you can't wait to go out that night because you're wearing your jacket. Yeah. You know, you can't wait to put the thing on because it goes with the rest of your outfit. And I kind of wanted to do that at a, a, a middle market price range rather than, you know, two, two and a half grand for the next 40 years on Klarna or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that how they do it now then? Well, a lot of them, yeah. I haven't done it on mine. I don't, I don't, I'm not doing it, but a lot of them do, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're just strapping people up yeah. with more, you know. But um, yeah, so that's, that's where I'm going with it. So it is, a, it is a fashion brand, but I'm trying to get um, what, particularly look like your yeah, designer brands, um, but for more of an affordable price. Yeah. Because um, I don't believe anyone's really doing that. It's either super cheap out there or it's super expensive. There are middle market. Mm. I think Ralph Lauren and people like that are seen as middle market. Yeah. But they don't really do street style or anything like that as such. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's what I just like, to, just like to give people something that it makes them feel nice when they put it on rather than just go put a jacket on some cold. Yeah. Um, and that's what we've tried to do with them. Mm. And uh, we'll see, you know, it's going all right so far. Mm. So would you call yourself an entrepreneur then? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm business has so always been Not my just security. No, I've been mean, using was a security company there because that's what I knew, you yeah. know. But, um, you know, I mean, we've got, a, we've got an office for the security company in Palace Street, Westminster. Um, and that does quite well. We do all over Europe, but most of it's central London. Mm. A lot of hotels and theatres. Um, high, high class events. We don't do pubs and clubs or anything like that, really, right. but um, bodyguards and residential security. So we do a lot of that. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, I think I, my, first, my first business was when I was about eight and a half years old at school, and I used to sell Donald Duck stickers, a whole ro ro roll of them. Um, unfortunately, after about two weeks, I got shut down due to the fact that all these stickers were being plastered by the school <laughs> for not a lot of money. Yeah. Um, but I realised as early as that that all you've got to do is buy something and sell it for more than what mm. you bought it for and you've got, you got the bit in between. Yeah. So, um, and I've always sort of bits and pieces like that throughout my life. It wasn't, um, it wasn't particularly because I wanted to work for myself or anything like that. And really a bodyguard, when I, when I was bodyguard, it, that was a freelance. So, it's kind of run like a business, you know, the product being me. Yeah. Um, getting yourself out there to get your face in front of places so you pick the work up and been mm. doing a good job when you're there. Um, it's always something I've been, you know, even when I was younger, I always had money. Even in the army, everyone was always skint in the army, but I always had money, not mm. loads, but a bit more than everyone else. By the third week, everyone was waiting for payday at the end of the month, but I always had a bit, I was always good with money. Yeah. And I always get, letting it go in the right places. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, I love business. That's my thing. It's not really a, a product or a service. I just love business. I like putting people together, putting teams together, um, just watching it grow and orchestrating and tweaking and moving and that hasn't worked and that has worked and maybe they're no good and sorry, but you've got to go and we bring these people in and we try that. You know, all, all, you know, so all the stuff what, what goes with business. Mm. Um, I just enjoy, I thoroughly enjoy doing all, all of that. Um, and I'm lucky, like I mentioned earlier, that one of the things that comes about is, you know, normally sensible amount of cash flow coming through, if that's what you're into, that sort of thing. Mm. But that's where my enjoyment is. It's from being successful, even in the films, doing the films and stuff. You know, it's nice to do, get Do you in. play the typical role that you are, or do you? Yeah, yeah. I've, I'm typecast, obviously. Yeah. I doubled for Dave Bautista in um, right. movie Final Score quite a number of years ago now. I was still a working yeah. bodyguard. I started movie work in 2010 mm. and I was still working uh, as a bodyguard and I went out to Morocco to film uh, or do a film with Matt Damon called Green Zone which was a, a US Army mm. uh, weapons of mass destruction film yeah and uh, I went out away and worked on that and I knew back then that that's something I was going to want to do um, and but I was still a working bodyguard so it wasn't massively appropriate to pursue it and I just left it until I decided to totally t take a you know step away from the the security world if you like get more involved in 
things like this with you and I've been in over 50 or 60 publications now worldwide right. TV number of TV channels yeah. and you know, normal stuff um, I went to acting school I got a diploma in screen acting I managed to finish it during because it was a school it wasn't really shut down that often yeah um, so I managed to get that and then I got I got onto spotlight and then I set up my IMDB and yeah I, yeah I've just been going ever ever since then really so um, got one movie next year um, which I think is going to is a gangster type movie. I mean, mm. everything is soldier, police officer, prison inmate, prison officer. You know, you've got to do a Guy Ritchie one. Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> you, I'd that, love you, to do a Guy Ritchie great. one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I used to get put on, in the in the in the uh, papers quite a lot for being like Jason Statham. Yes. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Actually, if you put me and him together, we look nothing like each other. <laughs> but um, I'd, you know, I'd love because of that because I've yeah. had that for a number of years now, and there's a lot. A lot worse people to sort of say what you look like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. You look like Jimmy Savile. Mate. <laughs> 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 so, I mean, <laughs> so I'm quite. I'm, That's Harry in the background yeah. laughing his head off. Yeah. By the way, so I'm quite. Yeah, I'm yeah. quite lucky with Jason Statham, yeah. um, yeah. given all the people you could have chosen. So I'm quite. I'm, yeah, I'm quite lucky with that. But yeah, I'd love to do something with him. Yeah, yeah I'd love, just because of the association yeah. I've had with him. For you so you many like cars times. as well, don't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so you um you can drive um armored vehicles, can you? I can do yeah. armored vehicles. Is, actually, the, is yeah. the training for that? I guess driving a really heavy, quite limited. Vehicle. Is what you can do with an armored yeah. vehicle. Again, a lot of people think of Hollywood bodyguards, handbrake turns. Yeah. And, you, know, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Um, to do anything like that is practice all yeah. the time, and you yeah. don't get that much practicing. But things like armored vehicles and that, you can't you roll the thing over; it's too heavy. Oh right. So you, you, you're very limited. To Even just doing. with bulletproof glass and stuff, they get really heavy, do they? Yeah, there's very few there's very few armored vehicles in the world. Most of them are up armored, so they start off as a normal vehicle, right? And um, they, you know the armor gets put yeah. on. So quite often, depending on what stage it's at, it'll only be the shell that you're in might be armored. If they're more up armoured, they, they maybe did the engine compartment as well. Yeah. But quite often they all start, people don't know that, I think, that to actually be built as an armoured car from the beginning. Someone like President of the, of the States, he, that's an armoured car. That would yeah. be built right from day one as an armoured car. Right. Um, but there's very few of that type of car around. Most are up armoured off the back of Toyotas or you know BMWs or whatever else. Mm. But the weight difference... Well, they're a lot heavier. Yeah, yeah, they are. Because you think the windows are like, you know... Two, two inch thick yeah. and they do come down slightly but it's about that much just to get a bit of air in the car yeah. if you want it and that's it um, and even then it depends on what you've got someone might not let them drop at all and they've yeah. got a better air conditioning filter on them but um, yeah it's just you've got to be careful with them because mm. obviously the tyres uh, they normally run on run flats because you don't want a flat tyre yeah um, but, then, but it's different speeds uh, different ways to drive you've got run flats um, so yeah it's a little bit to it but it's not it's not technical, it's knowledge, right. actually. It's not, if you can drive a car, you just have to have the knowledge, because you just have to know to go a bit slower. You have to understand that turning corners is, you know, you've got a bit of, it's a bit like probably driving a truck, I've never driven an Arctic truck, but, you know, the way, so it's not, in terms of doing handbrake turns and learning, it's nothing like that, really. <laughs> it's just knowing what the car can do. You do a J-turn, so you'll reverse up, and then you'll just drive off. Yeah. You know, it, it's the quickest way to do it. It's the safest way to do it. Um, and last thing you want to do, especially if you're getting ambushed or something, is roll your vehicle because you're getting a bit excited with your handbrake. Right. You know, right in the middle of an ambush. Yeah. And you can put everyone else, you know, get everyone killed because of it. So yeah. everything's done. Although you're in a panic situation, you still got to try and, you know, think about it sensibly and do it the safe way as possible and the quickest mm. way as possible. Yeah. And armoured vehicles, um, you're restricted. <clears throat> but at the same time, you're in a, supposedly, not always, you're in a safe environment. If it takes you a few seconds longer because you're doing a J-turn and not an handbrake turn, you should be all right within that. If you, I think they're normally good, depending on what armour state again. I think you get six strike marks on the window before it go through. Right. Um, depending again what weapon. I mean, there's all sorts of parameters and factors to it, but that's within sort of normal sort of mm. rifle. Yeah. Um, I think we used to get. Well, I used to travel convoys in Iraq. We used to get four or five at least before a window would go through. Ah, so you've been shot at plenty of times. Oh, convoys used to get hit all the time. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah. Because you had to stay to the main supply routes out there because right. you, was, you was escorting big trucks, mm. so you couldn't use any back street side roads, you know, tracks. So you just used to get wellied every day. Yeah. Shit. Normally, normally roadside bomb, but sometimes it would be, um, like, you know, full ambush RPG and small arms. Yeah, lots of guys died on that those years out there.
Really? Yeah, for a private security company, yeah. Lots of, lots of guys died from that. In security details you've been involved in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the company at the time, I think they've been sold now to G4S, but they, we had something like countrywide. I was in Baghdad. We had some guys in the south, some guys in the north, and I was in the, kind of in the middle. I think we had something like 45 convoy teams, and we all used to travel out to all the surrounding um, countries, so down to the south, we'd pick up from Kuwait, uh, out to the west, pick up from Jordan. Um, and Jordan was always out by Fallujah and Ramadi and Abu Ghraib prison, it's quite a famous prison out that way, and that was always troublesome. Down south wasn't quite as bad, so if you had to run down to south, quite often wouldn't get anything. Going out west, I think we got hit by three IEDs once on the, just going out to pick the kit up. Wow. Three IEDs in about 30 minutes. Blimey. And that's before we even picked the stuff up. And when you're going to collect, you go as fast as you can, because you can, but when you collect it, obviously, you go a lot slower because of the, you know, the articulated lobbies can't go that fast. So, um, yeah, if you used to get hit, you used to get hit quite hard on that. Oh, shit. Yeah. But I did that for, I did that, that job I finished before I went to Afghanistan. Did you enjoy that job? I learnt a lot. <laughs> what did you learn? Um, the medical package on it, as you can imagine, is quite good. Right. Um, we used to... <laughs> we, you mean the extra pay? The, the, yeah. yeah. No, no, as in like the, your medical skills. You had to, oh. you know, everybody had to be on the same sort of level in right. terms of... So, so you can help you can people help, if they yeah, been help everyone. Out. Yeah, we all used to carry our own medical kit, which was only for us. So the idea of it was you never had to stitch yourself up or anything. No, like that. no, no, no. It's not a Rambo movie. But <laughs> <laughs> um, the idea was that if you get hit, um, either you use it on yourself, or the person who is treating you uses it on you. You never use your own kit on someone else. Right. So on top of that, we did have big full med kits in the vehicle as well. But we used to all carry. That's, that's how much you got hit. Every every truck had two body bags on it. Oh my um, God. If you run out of body bags, you do sleeping bags. So that's the kind of job that was. What yeah. made you want to get into this line of work? Uh, well, I was in the army. But why would? But surely you know when you get in the army, this yeah, is well, the shit when, you're going to do. Yeah, no, totally. But when I was younger, I mean, you don't totally expect that. But when, when I was younger, what I wanted to be was a soldier. You know, if people want to be astronaut, people want to be scientists and you know, Olympic skier or whatever. I don't know. But I wanted to be a soldier. Now you know what you know. Would you recommend other people um, get into that line of work? Yes and no. All I'd say is. Not so much the private security, because that was the prop, you know, the prop end of dangerous, really. Um, which I did enjoy, which is obviously why I did it. You know, I don't have any regrets of anything I've done there, but... So the private security was much safer and easier, is that what you're saying? No, no, it was a lot worse. Oh, really? In the Middle East. Not, oh, okay. not in yeah. London, UK, yeah. and all that's fine, but in the Middle East it's a lot worse, because you don't have the same support. Right. You don't have aircraft, and you know, the Army, the Army, US or British would come and pick you up if you got wounded or hurt, but yeah. you was never first on the list. If they had right. their own guys done, then they had to go there first. Um, so uh, I would say you've got to really want to do it. It's not something you should go and do if you're like, mm, you know, I'm not really sure if I want to do it. And if you want to join the the army, if you don't know what to do in life, you want to experience moving around and having fun, because it is a lot of fun as well, it's not all just bullets, particularly at the moment, there's not a lot going on in the world, it's pretty a great time to be in the army. Mm. Um, although there is a lot of stuff in the background going on, but nothing, nothing we're particularly engaged with at the moment. Yeah, um, uh, Yeah, I think it just depends on, on, you, on, the, on you as a person. If you're doing it because you really don't know what, what you want to do, and it's not for you, then uh, maybe not, maybe go and find something else to do. Mm. But it's very good for people with not a lot of guidance, maybe from trouble backgrounds. Yeah. Um, maybe, you know, from, from, I mean, I'm not from a wealthy, wealthy family. My, my uh, father was a firefighter for 35 years, and um, my mum had various jobs bringing me and my sister up. So we, we always had money, you know, with a mm. house and bits and pieces, but we're never, not a wealthy family by any stretch of imagination. So, um, <clears throat> I think the military was something that uh, got me a lot of confidence as a young lad. Um, I enjoyed the thrill of flying out of different countries and doing different things. Um, you know, you are a boy and within, within a couple of months you're, you're a man really. And you have to be because you are carrying guns and ammunition and you know, all the other stuff that goes with it. So it, it worked really well for me. Does it work well for everyone? Probably not. No. No. No, probably not. So I don't know. I don't know if I would. I, I wouldn't not promote the military. There's a lot of good, but then also there is bad. 
and you have to bear that in mind. Don't, you can't join the army thinking it's never going to happen because it might. Yeah. Mm. We do a quick fire round in the show. You're up for it? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Are there any situations you've been in where you think, shit, I made the wrong decision, a bad decision? Yeah, lots. Can you tell us your worst one? Uh, worst one, I was, in, uh, I was in the Palestine Hotel in Baghdad having dinner on the 18th floor and it got rocketed, we got attacked and the rockets hit the 12th floor and set everything on fire um, and at the time couldn't get down. That one I thought, why did I do this job? Right. <laughs> for, for, yeah. for, for not very long, but yeah. I did think, and, I, and uh, when that happens, I always use, because it happened quite a few times, to be fair, different things like that, where I thought, why did I take this job? And I think, but you've only got yourself to blame. You always wanted to do this job. You know, you yeah. signed up for it. No one sent you out here because at the time it wasn't in the army, it was private security. So just tough shit, mate. This is your choice. Swallow it, and what's going to happen now is going to happen. Mm. And I well, did that every time. But yeah, I used yeah. to, it was a few times, I think, you fucking idiot. Like, <laughs> You signed up for it. Yeah. No one put you in this position. You did it. Yeah. 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 It's a few times like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, thankfully you got down because obviously 9/11 they didn't get down above, did no. they? No. No. So. It was lucky like they put it out as well. But the problem is back then as well the fire brigade wouldn't come on site because they were uh, Iraqi fire brigade. Right. So you couldn't trust that it wasn't going to come in and blow up. So yeah. you used to try and fight everything yourself, and with it fire extinguishers from. Um, for lower ground levels of fighting it for the enemy, you know, it's worked out obviously on me, I know, so. Mm. But, um, yeah, there's a few times like that where I just thought, you know, I've, I've over, I've pushed the boat out a bit yeah. too much <laughs> on this one, yeah. yeah. This could be curtains, but. Yeah. Um, but you're still here. But I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, would you rather have one million pound cash there mm. now, or one million engaged social media followers and Oh, why? one million cash all day long, yeah. Why? Uh, because I can do a lot more with that. Yeah, I could, I could use that to do a lot more and get one million followers from that cash. Mm. If I just had one million followers, I might be able to make one million pound. But I think, I mean, it depends on your quality of followers and all the other stuff that goes with it to be able mm. to make the money out of it. But realistically, I'd have the money all day long. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't see a point in having a big following or being famous if you're not making money, because as time goes on, it's an infringement on your life. And you do have to just, again, the A-list, you do have to change the way you do things. And to change the way you do things costs money. So if you're someone who's super, super famous, but on, on a, um, an everyday budget, you've still got to get on, you can't get on the bus, so, because you just get mauled to death. Yeah. But you, you can't afford a taxi, you know, or you can't afford a driver. So you have to, there's no point in, I think Love Island's a good culprit for this. A lot, a lot of people, youngsters these days, thinking it's great being famous. You wait till you can't go to the supermarket and buy a bottle of milk in your tracksuit bottoms and hoodie without getting called a drug addict because you've just popped out your house and look a bit of a mess. You know, mm. all the things we do day in, day out is, and think nothing of it and you can't move around. No, it's fine. If you're making, to me, I can make that sacrifice if I'm making a small fortune out of it and I can change my life accordingly. I have in maybe having a house out of the way and the security cameras and all the other stuff that you would need with it, um, then that's fine. But, but imagine being super famous with no money. How would you ever, the two would clash, you wouldn't be able to do it. And quite often they say when um, <coughs> celebrities are too good to get on trains and celebrities are too good to go on buses, they're not, I'd love to be able to do that, I just can't do it. It's not, mm. you know, it's not the right thing to do. So yeah, I'd, I'd, have, uh, I'd have the money yeah. and if I, tur if I really wanted to be famous, I could turn it into, turn it into fame if I really wanted to. Yeah. Really. What would you say is the biggest mistake you've made in your career? None. None? No, no mistakes? No. As far as I'm concerned, no. Are you just looking so, back with hindsight? Because yeah, if, if I, if I, um, but it's nothing I've done where I can say I shouldn't have done that, to be honest. Is that because you've got a good philosophical outlook? Possibly. Yeah. Well, it's nothing's upset me enough and thought that's gone wrong. Do you know no. what I mean? And, mm. um, you, know, you know, yeah, no, nothing really. I mean, there's probably stuff I could have done better. For sure, I could, you know, stuff I could, I know the stuff I could have done better. Mm. Uh, maybe studied a bit longer for it, or just put a bit more effort into what I did do. But there's nothing I've done where I think, shit, given my time again, I never would have done that. There's no. nothing, there isn't. What about any regrets? Is there anything you regret doing or not doing? Um, one thing I always say, you should never regret. You should never regret. And it doesn't mean, to, it doesn't matter what it is in either, you should never regret. Now, it doesn't mean to say you should do it again, and it also doesn't mean to say it's right or wrong neither. But you, when you do something, regardless of what it is, you make a decision in your head whether it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. And you personally thought it was the right thing to do and that's why you did it. And you have to 
sort of stick by that and stay with that. Now, I'm not talking about killing people and stuff like that, because I'm sure there's a lot of regret what would go with something like that. But in your normal day-to-day -day life, I don't really regret anything, because even if it's not been the right decision and it's maybe not gone how I wanted, I always think, but I thought about this enough at the time, I chose to do that, and it just didn't, I don't regret doing it, because that's what I chose to do at the time. Mm. Yeah, would I do it different? Yeah, of course, but yeah. you know, I don't regret it. Mm. And what about your most brutal life lesson? You must have seen some shit. What's your most brutal? brutal? Yeah. Um, how cheap life is, in in you know certainly in other countries, but in general, really, but more so in other countries. In certain countries. How, how do you mean? How well, cheap just life is? you just walk down the road and get your head cut off. You know, or get get shot, or and no one cares. Bomb goes off, kills sixty people. It, it's your life's very very fragile, and because we don't get trouble like that here as such. Um, I say as such because of obviously all the stabbings, particularly around London area. Um, life's very, very cheap. You know, it's so easy. It doesn't take a lot to get rid of you. And that doesn't matter how poor you are, how rich you are, you know, how intelligent or how dumb you might be. Everybody's on the same page with that. Mm. Um, that if a bomb goes off, you're going to die. It's, no one's exempt. Mm. Um, so yeah, life's cheap. Life's very fragile. Um, and in this country, we don't get we don't get the feeling and perception of that because by and large we're all right. But mm. there are some places where I used to work, obviously, where you'd see people dead on the side of the road quite often, um, for whatever reason. You know, I saw a woman getting stoned to death once um, by a, you know four or five guys just beaten and stoned and just life's because you know they don't give a shit. Life's life's cheap. Um, and it, and it is, if you're in the wrong environment, it is, mm. it is very cheap. And that's quite, when you think about it like that, you think, oh, you know, that'd be my worst nightmare. Mm. And, and those people living out in those places all the time like that, every day, yeah. day in, day out. Mm. But life is cheap. And this show's called Disruptors. Yeah. What, what does the word disruptive mean to you? Disruptive means naughty. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Possibly exploiting topics that maybe people don't like to talk about. Yeah. Um, and just dis disrupting the whole of <laughs> um, your channels <laughs> mm. <laughs> into, into wanting people to sort of view your podcasts and uh, over others, I guess. Mm. And there's one thing I've never asked anyone to do, but you said um, when you first meet people, how they dress. Yes. So um, this, what you're reading. So for this. me, yeah. I can tell straight away. You got a few quid. <laughs> Because <laughs> right, I know I what I'm looking at. I might not have taste, but I might have money. Got a few quid, yeah, so yeah. I know that straight away. Yeah. Um, you can be brutally honest. Yeah, yeah, no, way. if I yeah. say brutal, yeah. I like the style. Yeah. It's not for me. Yeah. I won't wear it because it just wouldn't look... There's a lot of stuff I look on people and think, oh, it looks, that looks great, but I know if I had it on, it wouldn't look the same. Do you know mm. what I mean? So I like the style. I like everything that's going on because it's different. Yeah. It, it, it is just, just, just it's different, it's a, but it's a nice different, it's a subtle different, it's not a... It's not a weird different, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, I can just see that you're, you're, you're cleanly dressed and it's all, you know, expensive. <laughs> expensive <laughs> materials and do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I, I don't ever, I don't judge by people by what they wear. What I, what, what I always think is if you're happy in what you're wearing, you can walk down the road in a nappy if you want. Makes no difference to me, really. I'm not bothered. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? As long as you're not hurting anyone, yeah. then that's fine. Um, but if you're wearing a nappy and you're you're not happy about it, well, let's do something. You know, let's do something about it, and let's mm. get you in something a bit better. But you do. But otherwise, you know, it's, it's, especially in London, you see all sorts of characters, don't you? Yeah. Um, if you're wearing dirty jeans and a smelly white t-shirt, but you're happy in that, you know, as long as you're not. Uh, up to certain too many people with your smell. Yeah. Then if that's you know if that's you, then that's you. Isn't it? Everyone's mm. different. Yeah. And where can we follow you? Where are you most active online? So Instagram probably Simon dot Newton. Um, obviously Simon Newton London will be for the clothing on the yeah. Instagram. Um, Simon Newton London for TikTok as well. Yeah. Um, and that's probably it. I've got a website Simon Newton dot UK, and that's just a website for me where you can see all different podcasts. Yeah. Uh, publications and films and movies and stuff. I mean, obviously next year um, is a couple of movies oh. we'll, we'll be doing. Can you give us any sneaks? Uh, well, so one is um, part of the, uh, is going to be part of the Foot Soldier franchise. Right. Um, so I don't, I'm not entirely sure where we're going with it at the moment, but next year we're going to be doing something quite nice, I think, and I, sh I should have a part, small part in that, hopefully. So it's that, and then um, 
I did have something in the States, but it's because of his striking, it's all on hold at the moment. Right. So I'm hoping this striking gets sorted out this year so we can move on with that. And the, and the States one will be more of a, it will be a Statham type movie. Yeah. Whether it be in or not, I don't know. But you know, that sort of standard of movie. So, um, yeah, there's a, couple of, there's a couple of little bits. So hopefully you'll see me on the screen. But the problem is if we film next year, it probably won't be out until the year after. Yeah. But yeah, there's stuff there coming up. Well, we, um, we keep the episodes up. Yeah, yeah. Eight, eight years and still going. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's going to be it's going to be a lot more from that as well because once I get stuck into bits, it's quite hard getting into the film world anyway. Yeah. Um, but I know that's a snowball for me because I just make it so it works mm. like that sort of thing. So I know um, over the next sort of five years, there should be quite a lot, a lot of stuff content for film wise for me and acting. Yeah. Simon, thank you very much. I no really appreciate your time. Thank Thanks you for having me. All right. <laughs>